Good evening. Welcome back from our two-week hiatus. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the sacrament of anointing of a sick, um, but also talking about some basic funeral things to kind of think about, prepare for, um, because I don't know about you, but I've dealt with death more in my young life than I'd really like to, and there's a lot of things that I've learned as a priest um, that I think would help a lot of families down the road. So we'll be talking about those things tonight. Before we get started, but as always, we begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, enlighten our minds, enliven our hearts, and inflame our spirits. Send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Be with us this evening as we delve into the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and delve into the hard conversations many times to have about end of life issues. Watch over us, watch over our family and our friends. We ask all these things in your son's name for he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So one of the things that I've been trying to do as we've been having these classes is to take what you see out in society and to cast aspersion on any of the rumors that big society says the Catholic Church actually teaches. Uh, one of them I heard last night, we were talking about um, cremations. And does the Catholic Church allow us to be cremated? Well, early church, no. In fact, when you look at the Emperor Nero in Rome, they would burn the Christian body so they couldn't be buried. So the long-time long thought was, we cannot be cremated because it's sacrilegious. Our understanding of the body and the soul has changed over time. And so there's actually a rite in the, in the funeral book called the cremation rite. So yes, as Catholics, we can be cremated. You don't have to be buried in a casket. But different from what society will tell you, if you are cremated or have your loved one cremated, the ashes must be buried. Now, how many times have we seen on TV shows they've got grandma's ashes up on the, uh, the mantle? Or nowadays, the, the big thing that a lot of funeral homes are going towards are making your loved ones into jewelry and then wearing them as, I don't know about you, but that sounds disgusting to me and a little sacrilegious because it is. But that was part of the fear, I think, in the early church with cremations is that we are no longer respecting the dignity of the body. And so if we go to, towards cremations, which a lot of places are because it's a whole lot cheaper, we have to still respect the dignity of the body. Uh, so I'm just bringing this up because this has come up a lot of times since I've been here even. Wait, we can have cremations? Wait, what do you mean we have to bury the ashes? So if you have a loved one who has been cremated and you still have the ashes, we can help you out. We can do a um, graveside service um, at any of our cemeteries and bury their ashes with dignity. Um, so just kind of putting that out there as a thing to think about. Um, we should never scatter ashes. We should never hold the ashes. We should never divide the ashes. Same thing as scattering ashes. Um, a lot of families that have a lot of kids are like, okay, we have seven kids, so each person gets a little piece of mom. It's like, when, when you break it apart, I mean literally break it apart, and look at what you're doing, that's just... Morbid. It doesn't make any sense, but we don't normally think logically or rationally when we're thinking about those things in the moment of the death of our loved one. We think we miss them, we love them, we want to take care of them. And so when we're, when we're talking about end-of-life issues, we have to look at everything at the end of life the same way we're called to look at them throughout our lives. The dignity of the human person from conception to natural death and everything in between. How do we respect the dignity of the body for a child that has been aborted, for a child that has um, not been born into the world but was miscarried? How do we look over the people that don't have anyone to take care of them after they've died? There are many homeless that die on the street and, and die without dignity. Well, you can't die without dignity. The world may not see your dignity. It may not give it to you. But before God, we, are all, we all have dignity. Um, and so trying to figure out how to work with those issues before we get to those concerns. Uh, one of the things that I was very grateful of in my family was about nine months before dad died, we sat down as a family and had the conversation, where are mom and dad gonna be buried? Mom is from LA, dad is from New York, we live in Oklahoma. One of the siblings at that time lived in DC, one lived in Virginia, one lived in Florida, the other two of us lived in Oklahoma. Where are mom and dad gonna be buried? 
Well, I was the first one to speak up and say, hey, I'm a priest for the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. I'm here for the rest of my life unless something happens. I'm here for the rest of my life. So my preference would be that you guys be buried here in Oklahoma. If you want me to come visit you more often than not, be buried at Resurrection Cemetery. You may say, well, why is that? Well, the pastoral center where all of the diocesan functions happen, it's right next door. So for me, I've had the ability in the last 14 months to go visit my dad at least once, if not twice a month, go pray with him, go thank him, just spend some time with him. And he is still there in his body in the ground. That I have a place that I can go to and say, Lord, be with me here. Dad, I know I'm here with you and you're here with me. It's one of the reasons why we bury our dead is to give them the dignity in their death that we hope to give them in their lives. But how many families have even started to think about death? How many times have we in our own lives experienced, oh no, what's the first thing you do after a loved one dies? Who do you contact? How do you go about setting up the funeral? Again, all really difficult things to talk about, especially if you haven't talked about them prior. So begin to have those conversations as families. I know, again, it's, it's a hard conversation to have, but I promise you, if you go before your loved one, they will appreciate the fact that you guys have had that conversation. Because that was one of the struggles with my dad. Every priest and deacon at your ordination, within a week, we are given a form that says, in the event of my death, here's where I'm to be buried, here's what my funeral is going to look like, and all of these different things. I am my father's son. I kid you not, two weeks before we got quarantined for him getting COVID, I filled mine out. I had already been a priest for five years at that point. My dad had never filled his out. He had been a deacon for six years at that point. And at that point, I said, um, have the bishop do it. Have it at the cathedral. I don't care what the music is. I don't care what the readings are. I'm going to be dead. Bury me wherever. Because that's what most of us think of, right? I don't care where I'm buried. I'm dead. Just make it look good, right? Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just morbid like that. I don't know. <laughs> but after my dad's death, then we had to go through and pick the readings and pick the music and pick the venue and pick who was going to celebrate and pick who was going to preach and pick where he's going to be buried and buy all those different things. I realized, ah, what I'm really doing is setting my family up for more grief because they have to try and make decisions based on how they know me. And my family knows me pretty well. You guys know me pretty well at this point. You can probably pick different things that would be good. But again, the funeral is as much for the living as it is for the deceased. It's for us to come together to give thanks to God for the life of this individual, for this person, and to remember them and to remind ourselves that even though we may not have that same experience of them, Death is a change, not an ending. And in fact, in the funeral liturgy, anytime we have a mass, in the first um, preface for the funeral rite, that's what it says. Life is changed, not ended. We as Catholics believe that. The struggle, though, is many times in life, we don't live that way. We live as if one of the philosophers used to say, your death is a tragedy in my life. My death is the end. I will be saddened when you die. When I die, it's all over. It's like, oh, that's such a pessimistic way to live. But that's how we look at life, don't we? The irony of that, when we look at everything under the same guise, as we've been talking about with all the other sacraments, we've been talking about this whole class, what are we called to long for more than anything else? Heaven. What's the only way to get there? To die. <laughs> yes, be one with Jesus, yes. But the only way to get there and remain there is to die. And from the beginning, when we, remember when we talked about sin and, and the sin in the garden? What was the kind of root of all the sin? It was doubt, right? Doubt and fear. Think about that in terms of death. I doubt an eternal life. I doubt that what God has told me is real. Therefore, I fear my death. But if we truly believe what God gave us, what he told to us, we would rejoice as St. Paul does in the possibility of death. Now, it's only taken me the last 30 years, 35 years, to get to that point in my own life where it's like, ah, I finally understand the lunacy of that argument. Because it isn't really lunacy. It's an argument based in faith. Faith that everything we do in this life is meant to get us to heaven. 
And so when we look at all of the sacraments, when we look at the funeral, when we look at all of the different rites we have in the church, that's the lens we're called to look through. How does this help me embrace God's love? And how does this ultimately help me get to heaven so I can have that personal relationship with Christ? Yes, on this side of the veil, but also on the other side. And so one of the really contentious sacraments that this kind of talks about it in is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. You will find people on both sides of this camp, priests, bishops, church historians, on who should be anointed and when it should happen. You will have some on one side that say, you should only be anointed 10 minutes before you die. You have some on the other end that says, if you have a sniffle or a cough, why have you not been anointed? We as Catholics, the Via Media, we want to fall in the middle. So who can be anointed? What are you guys' thoughts? Who can be anointed? Who should be anointed? The gravely ill. Define that term. Okay. So if I'm living in a pandemic world where I could get COVID at any moment, would that be gravely ill? I'm just putting it out there as devil's advocate. Okay. Well, so what the catechism says, and I asked that question because that is what the argument is over. What does the definition of gravely ill actually mean? Let's look at the catechism. In case of grave illness, the anointing of the sick is not a sacrament for those only who are at the point of death. That's the first line in the catechism, paragraph 1514, under who should receive this. The anointing of the sick is not a sacrament for those only who are at the point of death. Hence, as soon as any one of the faithful begins to be in danger of death from sickness or old age, the fitting time for him to receive this sacrament has certainly already arrived. Which means, one of the big burdens I have as a priest, and I have as being Danny as a priest, is that I'm a people pleaser. I hate to not be there for people. One of the most gut-wrenching moments in my life as a priest is when I get a call to come to an anointing and I'm not in town. It happened to me a couple weeks ago, and the person died, and I couldn't be there. Tried to call another priest, didn't get there in time. When we look at the sacraments, again, it's who are the sacraments for? The living. We can't anoint you after you've died. We cannot baptize you after you have died. The sacraments are for the living. So if there is any fear of death, if you're going in for a surgery, if you're going in for something that may be potentially causing death in the future, talk to me. Get anointed. There's a whole ritual that goes into it. Normally, if you come and talk to me before Mass, I say, let's do it after Mass, because there's a lot of things that we do during Mass that are actually part of the liturgy that goes into the anointing of the sick, like the petitions and the creed and the Our Father and the Gospel. There's actually been times where we've read the Gospel that's in the anointing rite at Mass. It's like, hey, let's do this afterwards, because that way I can make sure that we can get you anointed in time so that you can go eat or whatever afterwards, and I can too. But any time you need to be anointed, do not ever use the excuse, Father, I didn't want to interrupt your busy schedule. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. I am never too busy to do the sacraments. I'm never too busy to hear a confession unless it's within five minutes of Mass. That's my only real cutoff there. And I'm never too busy to anoint unless it's five minutes before Mass or during Mass. Any other time... Email me, call me, text me, Facebook message me. If I am here, you're taken care of. If not, I will make sure that you are taken care of. When I was at the Catholic radio station for those two days, I got two calls. And so I immediately stepped off the radio, called Father Bala and said, hey, Father Bala, I know you've got mass at noon. As soon as you're done there, can I get you to go to Elk City Hospital and anoint these two parishioners? That's why we have connections with the priests around us. But again, he's the closest priest we have besides me, distance-wise. If I'm not in town like I wasn't the last 10 days, it becomes difficult at times. But I will do anything that I can to make sure that what we need is taken care of. But there have been times, my first year as a priest, <laughs> second year as a priest, I just moved to Corpus Christi, and I was in Portugal. Got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning in Portugal, which is like 8 at night here. Father, um... We have a parishioner that's on their deathbed and needs to be anointed. <laughs> I am 5,000 miles away. I will do what I can. 
I can't personally be there. The frustration when I got back was this person had been sick for three weeks. They waited until they had to make the decision to take them off of life support to give me a call. Please, I plead, I plead, I plead with you, do not wait that long. Because it breaks my heart when I walk into the room and your loved one has died. And I can't be there to comfort them or you. I can't be there to offer them the sacrament. I can't be there with you to witness that. Do not wait. If you know that you have a surgery coming up, if you have cancer, if you have a uh, debilitating illness that can end in death, if you're a diabetic and have never been anointed, get anointed. If you have cancer and have never been anointed, get anointed. If you're going in for any type of surgery, even if it's just for a finger surgery, if you are being put under the knife and you're being put out, get anointed. I can't say that enough because I've known people that have had the simplest surgeries. The next time I saw them was at their funeral. One of my old bosses, he went in for a simple shoulder surgery. And then I went to the hospital with his family because they were uh, working with me at the restaurant that we were at. And I had to be there with them. This was either right when I joined seminary or right before I joined seminary. And I had to be with them as they said, hey, um, Phil just died on the table. What? He came in for a routine, like, rotator cuff surgery. What do you mean he died on the table? But that's not the only one of those that I've heard. As a priest, unfortunately, we deal with death almost as often as we deal with life. I've done... I think as many funerals since I've been here as I've done baptisms, which is ironically a good thing because we have a lot of baptisms. We have a lot of new kids, but also I've been able to help a lot of families in their grief. Death sucks. There's no easy way to put it. For those of us who are left behind, death sucks. It does. But we're here for each other. As members of the body of the faith and the body of Christ, We are to be with each other in the highest of highs and in the lowest of lows. As a priest, there's been one day of my life where six of the seven sacraments I was able to participate in. The only one I didn't have was an ordination. I had a marriage, had a baptism, had a first communion, had a confirmation, had reconciliation, and had an anointing in the same day. Ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. But that's what it means to be a priest, to be all things to all people at all times. The problem, though, is we are in the 21st century where we don't have a lot of priests in a lot of places at any time. (laughs) And so I want to make sure that everybody's taken care of how they need to be taken care of. One of the things that we, as a church, as a world, don't talk about enough, um, and I'm only bringing this up because it's something that I'm hoping to start in the next six months or so with the diocese. Um, We don't talk about the fact that there have been so many families that have been touched by death that don't realize it. Have you ever had a miscarriage? I I would wager to believe that probably half of our parishioners at one point or another have been touched personally by a miscarriage. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about how to grieve the loss of that child. We don't talk about how do we support the family. And if you haven't had a miscarriage, who's been touched by abortion? Whether you've known about it, didn't know about it, have family members and friends. But again, that decision was made in the past. We can't do anything about the decisions that have been made in the past when it comes to abortion. Or whether my body was healthy enough to bring this child to term. What do we talk about when we talk about the dignity of the human person? It's not from birth to death. It's from conception to natural death and everything in between. So if you've had an abortion, if you've had a miscarriage, remember, God still loves you. God never stops loving us. We talked about that in our last class when we talked about the sacrament of reconciliation. There's only one unforgivable sin. Everything else, if we are truly contrite about it, we are called to seek out the sacrament of reconciliation. But if you've had a miscarriage, if you've had an abortion, if you've known of those, one thing I always tell the family, pray to God for the repose of the soul of your child. Name your child. And then ask for that child to pray for you. 
Because one of the beauties of the love of God is that it never changes. One of the beauties of God is he is not going to punish you for something you had no control over. Remember when we talked about the three things that make a mortal sin? Grave matter, consent, and knowledge. An infant in the womb has none of those. <laughs> so how could we ever believe in a loving God that would condemn any of those souls to heaven? It doesn't make rational or logical sense. And so if they aren't in hell, follow my logic, pretty easy, they must be in heaven then, right? Because those are really the only options. God's not going to condemn them. He's going to resurrect them. Which means those loved ones who have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith, no, not marked with baptism and claim for Christ, but marked with the sign of life given to them by their conception, they are in heaven. They are in heaven. They can and do pray for you. Do we ask for those intercessions? We, we as Catholics many times struggle with that question when our Christian brothers and sisters come to us and say, why do you guys pray to Mary? Have you ever had that question to you? We don't. We pray through Mary. We ask for her intercession. Why do you ask Mary to intercede for you? She's dead. First of all, no, she ain't. We believe in the assumption of Mary. She didn't die. That's part of our dogma of faith. Mary never died. She was assumed body, soul, and divinity, not divinity, body and soul into heaven. But also, if you are sick, do you ever ask for your friends to pray for you? Normally? Or put out a, hey, keep me in your thoughts. If you don't pray, put up, put up good intentions or good thoughts to the universe or however you want to word it in, in today's world. Well, that's what we're doing with Mary. We're saying, Mary, you bore God, Jesus, in your womb. Do us a favor and put in a good word for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Not the fruit of the loom, the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That because you were the Christ bearer, the Theotokos, you have some bearing over what he does. I mean, you don't dictate him, you don't control him, but he's going to listen to you. When we look at the first miracle that Jesus did, what was it? Wedding feast at Cana. Mama Mary goes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, um, we don't want to embarrass this couple that we came to celebrate with, and they're out of wine. Jesus, in this time, I guess it would have made sense, in our time, smack in the back of the face, woman, what concern is this of yours to me? Why should this concern me? And then what does Mary do? She doesn't turn to him in anger. She doesn't turn to him in distress. She says, do whatever he tells you to do. So when we pray for intercessory prayer, we are asking the Lord through the prayers of whomever we're interceding through, St. Matthew, Blessed Stanley Rother, Mary, whomever else, to lift these prayers to God's ears and to pray with us, to pray for us. Not to answer our prayers, but to join us in prayer. And so if we have loved ones who have gone before us that we believe could be at the side of Christ in heaven, who better to ask to intercede for us than those that we have those personal connections with? That's why when we go through the sacrament of confirmation, we have you pick a patron saint. That's one of the reasons, at least. Someone that you can model your life after, that then you can use as your intercessor. If you have different issues in life, there's different saints to intercede through. I still don't know why, if you're trying to sell a house, you intercede through Joseph, except that he was a carpenter. Do not go into the faux Catholic voodoo of taking a St. Joseph statue, bearing it upside down in your front lawn. That's not a Catholic thing. It's a pseudo-Catholic thing that they see on TV. In fact, there's a lot of stores that will actually sell the, st the statue, will have the whole prayer that goes along with it. Didn't come from the church. Came from someone that wanted to make money in the name of the church. And that's part of the struggle that we have many times when we talk about anointing, when we talk about death, when we talk about 
all of these different things, we see one thing out there in society, and there's another thing completely that the church teaches. How many times have we gone to social media to get our news? Has anybody else been trying to follow who's being hired at OU but me? I've been on Twitter every five seconds. The second I see eyeballs pop up, ooh, who they get, who they get, who they get. Is it going to be Brent Venables? Is it going to be Dabble Sweeney? Is it going to be Nick Saban? Please no. Though he's a good Catholic. But we follow all of this fake news, and of course that terminology now has a negative or positive based on politics that all of these words that we have put meaning into that don't truly attribute that meaning to them, society has put meaning towards. They've redefined words, which is interesting because what is one of the names that we give to Jesus, the second person of the Trinity? The word of God. So by taking the words that the Lord has given to us and us giving our own definitions to them, we are saying, Jesus, you aren't enough. We want to form you in our image, not us in your image. And that's not a big stretch from what's happening in the world today. When we take these words and terms that for the longest time have always meant the same thing, but then it doesn't fit into my nice bubble, well, I have to redefine these terms to fit me. Since when? You've got to redefine yourself to fit those terms. <laughs> How dare you tell me to change? It's the only thing outside of death and taxes that we all have to go through. <laughs> death, taxes, and change, right? But we don't want to change because change is hard. Change means we have to, to go through and actually think things through. We have to be logical about things. And when we look at the sacraments, many times we, this is what I grew up with, or this is what I learned about it. Well, where'd you learn that from? I don't know. Well, let's look to some of those primary sources. That's the beauty of the catechism of the Catholic Church, is that when we go through and read that paragraph, it then gives us, it comes from Sacrosanctum Concilium. Well, what is that? Document from the Second Vatican Council. And it's from this canon and canon law, and it's from this canon and canon law. But it has all of these different primary sources that we can go to instead of, I found it on Wikipedia. <sighs> go to Wikipedia to find sources, not to be your source. That's how I did all of my research papers in seminary. I would start at Wikipedia. I would go through all of the BS at top to the bottom where it gives you all of the references. Now let me go find and see what Tertullian said. Let me go find and see what St. Augustine said. Let me go and find and see what Origen said. Let me go and find and see what Thomas Aquinas, Anselm, all of these doctors of the church said and not take Wikipedia for gospel truth because you know, literally anybody can doctor a Wikipedia page, right? You can go on any page at any time and put anything you want in there, and people fall for it all the time. We're trying to take truth, make it my truth. So when we look at things like end of life, that's why we have so many cult ideas, and even cults formed around, we never want to die. Well, if you never die, you'll never truly live. I mean, there's a movie that came out, and it's been out for a couple months, so I can kind of give a little bit of it away. I'm not going to ruin it too bad. Jungle Cruise. Anybody see the movie Jungle Cruise, Disney? Big, big Disney fan. It follows a lot the, the ride on the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland, Disney World. But in there, they're looking for more or less the fountain of youth or the tears of something or other that bring you to healing. We've always been looking for a way to extend our lives. Forgetting that this life is not the end-all, be-all. And that's one of the struggles that we have in living. And how many times while we're living, do we just go through the motions? Have you ever gotten into that? We're just kind of going through the motions and just kind of like a, me a mechanism, a cog in the machine. I've got to admit, it's always... I hate to use the word entertaining because that sounds vicious when you hear what I'm about to say, but it's somewhat entertaining to me at times when at mass, people will give responses or not make responses because they're just going through the motions. Like if I'm to say, the Lord be with you, you would say, I can't tell you how many times I chuckle inside when I hear, and also with you, how long has it been since you've been to mass? 
See, we get that joke because you know, but you know that we hear it. I guarantee you Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, you will hear at least two people say it. And I'll be like, because <laughs> it happens every time. Because we want to put out there, just like we do on our social media pages, this perfect image of who we are. That's why I, as your pastor, say I suck sometimes. I'm a failure. I'm a sinner. I recognize that. That's not a bad thing. Because you know what? Sometimes you guys suck too. And that's not a bad thing. Why do we find so much negativity and imperfection? I, I, I'm, I'm asking that question seriously because the world says we all have to be the same and we all have to be perfect or you're not worth it. It's a lie. God has made you individually as you. When we look at these sacraments, when we look at the beauty of the depth of wisdom in the church, how many times have we had people that have stood up and said, I know better than the church knows, or thought or taught authoritatively, or they thought they were teaching authoritatively, teaching contrary to what's in these texts. What gives you that authority? I've got 10 million TikTok followers. I've got 5 million Instagram followers. That gives me authority. If you pop authority, and people follow that. That's why there's so much division in the church I started, sorrowfully, started that week that I did the Catholic Radio TikTok page. The majority of the things I'm putting on there are for the parish. You may have seen some of them on Facebook and Instagram. I made those there to see if we can use that as a way to evangelize. Because I cannot tell you how disheartening it is to see some of the social media pages bash Catholicism. There's a priest, Father John, who gets on there every day and does like a two-hour live stream on TikTok. It's terrifying some of the comments that he gets in there. Hail Satan. Wait for the rise. 666. And it's like, this guy's just trying to go out there and preach the good news. Or every day, at least every 10th, what do you think about LGBTQ question mark? What do you think about... We love everyone. We don't... We don't Accept everyone's responses to everything, though. We can't justify sin. Oh, but the world does. The world justifies a lot of things. That doesn't make it right. The problem, though, is that is our litmus. The gospel and truth aren't many times. And so when we look at things like the anointing of the sick, when we look at things like what to do at the end of life, many times we have to come back to what is life about? And ultimately, the meaning of life, as I mentioned, I think week one, being loved by God, embracing that love, sharing that love, returning to God in that love. Or as it would have said in The Lion King, the circle of life. We can't give what we haven't received. We receive the love of God, we share it, we return to it. It's as simple as that. And Christ tells us time and time again in Scripture, you're making it too difficult. God gave us, in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. And then we've got the book of Leviticus that gave us even more rules. And what does Jesus say in the New Testament and the Gospels? The totality of the law and the prophets are summed up in these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. We make it so difficult. We go, yeah, but, no buts. Yeah, but I heard from this one place, did it come from here? From scripture, from tradition? Well, I mean, it came from small t tradition. Well, what does that mean? So having a conversation with someone last night about the rosary. And, well, is the rosary big t tradition or small t tradition? Well, there's a lot of people that would say big t. There's a lot of people that would say small t in the sense of, is it authoritative? Do you have to do it in a certain way? Well, every family kind of prays the rosary a little bit differently. What is the rosary? Well, it's, it's a way for us to focus our prayers to God through Mary, right? So whether you do all 20 decades of the rosary, 
You do five decades of the rosary. You do the Dominican rosary, which I just learned about recently. Have you ever heard of the Dominican rosary? Pretty much what you do is you do a mystery of the rosary. You do the first part of the Hail Mary, and the second part of the Hail Mary, you give an attribute to Jesus based on what the mystery was. So, for example, say we're doing the agony in the garden. We say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, who knelt in agony in the garden. Hail Mary. And so it's like, huh. That's kind of cool. It goes a whole lot faster. If you want to get the family to participate, the little ones to participate, highly recommend the, the French Dominican Rosary because it's a way for them. They're all going to say the same things when they're really young. Jesus is love. God, whatever it is, it gets them to participate. And how do we have a lot of youth in the parish? You start them young. It doesn't have to be anything big, anything ostentatious. For us growing up, it was the Rosary on Sundays, which we all hated, until they started giving us snacks. And they would, we were all very ADHD growing up. And so they would turn the lights off so we wouldn't be distracted. And I don't know if you remember these, the fiberglass filaments that had like the little strings in them that would like go in circles and turn different colors. Anybody have any clue what I'm talking about? Some people my age, kind of. We'd have those and it'd be like a, a disco ball on the roof in different colors that we would focus on and we would pray through the rosary. And it helped us to focus, well, what is part of the rosary but white noise? Saying the same thing over and over and over. Why do we have specific mysteries when we go through and pray the rosary? So we can focus on that mystery as we're praying the same prayer over and over and over. Same thing with the Divine Mercy Chaplet that was given to us through St. Faustina. We have all of these different small t traditions, and however you best embrace them, if they lead you to God, do it. Last night I was blessed to be with uh, 20 of our Hispanic uh, of our members of, of the Spanish-speaking community, and I went and prayed the rosary with them last night, and it was beautiful. And they asked afterwards, what did you think, Father? I said, it was long, but it was beautiful. Because before every mystery, they would make an intercession. They would also talk about what the mystery of the rosary was about. They would also then sing one of the verses of the song given to us through Juan Diego, La Guadalupana, La Guadalupana, La Guadalupana, Pajaltepeyac. You'd go through and sing it and sing it and sing it. And she's laughing. He's like, oh, Father, that was horrible. I know I tried, B. I'm trying. I'm trying. It didn't happen in front of me. I don't remember it. But they bring in all of these different traditions that they've learned through generations. But what has been handed on to us? How many of us are first generation Catholics? And as first-generation Catholics or Christians, we have to then create our own traditions, little T traditions. We all have our big T traditions. Go to Mass on Sunday, Holy Days of Obligation. Next Wednesday, Holy Day of Obligation. We will not have class. We will have Mass in place of that. Come to Mass next Wednesday, Holy Day of Obligation. And that's one of them that I'm giving you a preface or a precursor into the homily next week. It drives me crazy for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You ever read through the gospel before you look at it? The gospel every year for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception talks about Jesus' birth. Who was immaculately conceived that we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception? Mary. Nine months after December is September. What do we celebrate on September 8th? The birth of Mary. But the gospel <laughs> is the angel Gabriel coming and telling Mary that she is going to conceive Jesus in her womb. It's like, could you make this any more confusing for us that are trying to preach this, please? But again, it gives us the opportunity to kind of go into that. But again, the deeper we get into our faith, the more it begins to make sense. Why would you use that gospel when we're coming to celebrate Mary? if not for the notion that everything Mary did in her life from her conception on pointed and directed to her son. That even when we celebrate the feast of her being conceived immaculately without sin, she tells us about her son's conception through that gospel. It's beautiful. But again, it gives us another insight into what life is all about pointing back to Christ. And so when we talk about the sacrament of the anointing, there's a couple of things that go into it, and it's all very scriptural. The beginning, we begin the same way. We begin just about everything in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. 
And then there's a little instruction. My dear friends, we are gathered here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is present amongst us. So we're talking about why we are here, whose name we are here in, and that we aren't here alone. As the Gospels relate, the sick came to him for healing. We see that scattered all throughout the Gospels. Moreover, he loves us so much that he died for our sake. Through the Apostle James, he has commanded you, commanded us, are there any who are sick among you? Let them send for the priests of the church. Let the priests pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick persons. And the Lord will raise them up. And if they've committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven them. It's a quote from the book of James. So what's part of the sacrament of anointing? The priest will lay his hands on your head. Same way that the bishop does or whoever confirmed you does. Put his hand on your head. Then dips his hand in, not chrism, but the oil of the sick. And then on the palms of your hands, I want to make sure to read this so I get the right words. On your palms of your hands and then on your forehead, making the sign of the cross, he says, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. Amen. One of the questions that a lot of people have is, why do you have to be a priest to do the anointing of the sick? Because it's a sacrament of healing. Do you know what sacrament is supposed to go in tandem every single time we do the sacrament of anointing? Reconciliation. Do you know how often reconciliation happens during the sacrament of anointing? 10% of the time. Because 90% of the time that I am called out to anoint someone, it's someone that's unconscious or intubated. And so we pray this on behalf of this person, that their sins may be forgiven. Praying that in whatever consciousness they have, they are sorry for their sins. And normally for me, if the person is unconscious, I will, towards the end of the rite, give what's called the apostolic pardon. Normally that's what's given kind of on their way out. Through the holy mysteries of our redemption, may Almighty God release you from all punishments in this life and in the life to come. May he open to you the gates of paradise and welcome you to everlasting joy. There were two times that I cracked while anointing my dad. That prayer and the Our Father. Because I'm praying that the Lord may take his soul, that he may be at peace and may be at rest. The next time that I anointed someone the week after dad's funeral was, ironically, the funeral that I got COVID at two weeks later, went to his bedside, and I added in there, Ken, if my dad is in heaven, and this is the Lord leading you home, I pray that my dad be the first one to welcome you there, and then prayed this prayer. Because again, life and death, that veil is not torn. That when we come to the celebration of the Eucharist, right after what's called the preface and mass, right when we do the holy, 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 from that moment through the consecration, if we could see everything that's going on, we would see the angels and saints present with us. There have been times where I'll close my eyes and I'll chuckle. I know I've, I know I've talked about this sometimes. But I'll close my eyes and I can feel my dad there with me. I can feel my grandpa there with me. I, I can hear my dad saying, you got it right this time, Danner Banner. It's like, Danner Banner, really? That's what I remember from you? Come on, man. But that's the beauty of our faith. That life is changed, not ended. We are not infinite in the sense of no beginning, no end. But once we are created, we are not destroyed. Which means once you are conceived, we go on forever. And this was something that as a kindergartner, God must have really had a lot of faith in me as a kindergartner. As a kindergartner, I always struggled with the ideal of infinity and eternity. As a kindergartner, I was five. 
remember on the playground very vividly at Ramstein Air Force Base, on the playground. It was one of those big jungle gyms. It was like the half dome things. And I was there and I stopped and said, huh, I wonder how long heaven is. Well, it's eternity. Okay, yeah, but what happens after that? Well, forever. Okay, what happens after that? Well, eternity. Well, yeah, but, what, but how long is eternity? Like, like, because as a five-year-old, my idea of life is five years. As a 36-year-old, I can still only encompass 36 years of life. Those of you who are older than me, I don't understand it. But I know that it exists. As humans, we struggle with space and time. But the deeper I've gotten into my faith and understanding the mystery of the goodness of God, the more the veil begins to open. And I can see at Mass our loved ones with us. I can feel their presence. In the Eucharist, Christ is present with us. We enter into the moment of his passion, death, and resurrection. We don't repeat it. That's what a lot of our non-Catholic Christians say. Well, why do you keep crucifying Jesus every time we celebrate Mass? We don't. We leave space and time and enter into that moment. But if I'm bound by what I can understand, that makes absolutely no sense. Until I begin to realize it's not supposed to make sense. <laughs> That's okay. It doesn't have to make sense. Just knowing that it is, is good enough. And so when we look at the sacrament of anointing in the sick, when we look at the sacrament of reconciliation, we have to look and see why does God give us these sacraments? Viaticum is another term for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Do you know what it stands for? Communion for the way. Via, the way, com, communion. So the last time that you receive the sacrament of the Eucharist, you receive it in viaticum. Bread to give you energy for the journey, basically. The problem, though, is most time, again, that I go to anoint someone, I can't give them viaticum. Because if you have a mask on like this, I can't do anything. If you're unconscious, I can't do anything. If you've heard nothing else this class, don't wait. <laughs> What's funny is, I, I've been mentioning this a lot in just random homilies and I'll be like, oh, but Father, I've got a surgery coming up, but when is it? Stop me beforehand. We're going to get you anointed. Well, it's not, we're going to get you anointed. (laughs) But at the same time, I'm not on the other end of the spectrum that thinks that we need to be anointed every month. I know a lot of priests have First Friday or Third Friday where they'll have an anointing mass. That can be seen as an abuse because not everybody that gets anointed needs to be anointed. We want to make sure that we get anointed when we need it, but we don't need it every month. And in fact, when we get it, if the sick per- hold on, if a sick person who received this anointing recovers his health, he can, in the case of another grave illness, receive this sacrament again. If during the same illness the person's condition becomes more serious, the sacrament may be repeated. It is fitting to receive the sacrament of anointing of the sick just prior to a serious operation. The same holds for the elderly who frailly become more pronounced. So if you haven't been given a different diagnosis, if there's been no change in what you have, you've been anointed once, you don't need to be anointed again. One of the really hard balances as a priest is that there's a lot of people that are in nursing homes or are homebound or are sick that want me to visit every single day, every week to come anoint them. I'm one person. So I, I've kind of, and I'm a little harsh in this, probably more harsh than I should be, but because I have to put a line somewhere. I will come to anoint. We have Eucharistic ministers and parishioners that can come visit. That's how we work in this together. They can't anoint. Anyone can visit. I want to make sure that you're anointed and that you're good with God. And it tears at my heart and breaks my heart sometimes when I get parishioners, oh, Father, it's been so long since you've seen me. I saw you 10 days ago. But Father, yes, I know you want to send other people to come see me, but I want to see you. I understand that, but I can't be everyone's personal chaplain. That's why I rely on our Eucharistic ministers. But I want to make sure that you're getting what you need. That's why when we have our commissioning this weekend of our, new, our six new Eucharistic ministers, that's going to be part of it, as I'm giving everybody a pics and giving everybody a communion to the sick book. We went and bought, I think, 30 of each. 
so we can make sure to have plenty on hand so that people can bring communion to the sick. People can go and visit the sick if they feel up to that calling. Because, yes, the priests and deacons used to be able to do it so more off, so much more often, but they also used to be five priests per parish. Now, out here, I don't know how many we've had, but there used to be more priests. The rectory that I just moved from, I was the only priest there when I moved, or when I got there. I had to re-fix it so I could even move in. At one point, it had six priests living in it. Six priests in one parish. When I moved, there were three of us. One, he was living there because he was the hospital chaplain at St. Anthony's. One, he was living there because I had just gone to his bishop from Burma and requested him to come and be the associate because I don't speak Zopau, which is the Zomi dialect for our Burmese community at Corpus Christi. And so he's now the administrator, and Father um, Martin is still living there, just in residence. So we had three of us in residence for nine months, and then I got moved. <laughs> But that's rare. But that's why when I was gone two weekends ago, when Father T came out, I love Father Tarsicius, it's difficult to understand at times. In the name of the Father, I love it, I love it, I love it. Because the reality is there's only so many of us. And as long as the sacraments are being celebrated, it's good enough. We may not be fed, we may not get a great homily. We may not be able to understand everything, but the Eucharist is present every single time, and that's the most important part of coming to Mass. And that's something that's hard. Whether Mass is in English, Mass is in Latin, Mass is in Spanish, Mass is in Burmese, Mass is in French, German, Polish, whatever, it's the same because Christ is present. And that many times is the hard part. We're looking at having not next Monday, but the Monday after um, for the Feast of Our Lady Guadalupe, which we have to celebrate on the 13th instead of the 12th this year, because it's on a Sunday. Mass will be bilingual. Puedo hablar en español. Puedo celebrar la misa en español. Pero no puedo predicar en español. I can talk a little bit of Spanish. I can celebrate Mass in Spanish. I can't preach in Spanish. So it'll be a little bit of English, a little bit of Spanish. Some things I do well. Other things we rely on God's grace. And so when we look at the sacraments, we have to look back and say, what does the church actually teach? Not what did I hear in one place or see on a... <sighs> do not, do not, do not, do not, do not go to a blog to get your answers, please. Unless it's a blog. Unless it is Catholic Answers, do not go to a blog for your answers. Because I guarantee you, they will not be right. We ran into this actually earlier in this year with one, of our, with one of our RE classes where they found 300 questions and answers about scripture from a fashion magazine. <laughs> Didn't look at the source. In the first 50 questions, 10 of them were wrong. And they were coming from the King James Version of the Bible, not from ours. And so I was like, uh, yeah, let's rein this in and see where we go to for sources. But we don't normally think about that. You think if you can Google it, it's going to give you the right answer, right? Sometimes yes, other times no. So we've got to make sure that we're getting the right information. So we've got about five minutes up to class. I babbled on for long enough. Um, we will not have class next week. But are there any questions, um, concerns, comments, things you want to make sure that we talk about um, in the spring semester? Because we've only got one more class this semester. Right, this semester, I think in school term still. We've got one more class between now and Christmas. Uh, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. Um, and then we'll be off till January. Is there anything you want me to make sure that I cover? Um, or any questions you guys have? Yeah. Anointing the sick, yes. So, so yes, so... Um, when you do the, the anointing of the sick, is it just you and the sick, me and the sick person, or is it, so when we're doing the actual anointing, so like when you begin the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, anybody can be there present. In fact, I prefer if the family is there praying with us, because that really tells to the sick person that they aren't in this alone. In fact, one of the prayers right after the anointing itself goes, it's one of the most beautiful prayers that there is, I just haven't memorized it yet. Oh, come on. Father in heaven, through this holy anointing, grant your, grant so-and-so, comfort in his or her suffering. When he is afraid, give him courage. When afflicted, give him patience. When dejected, afford him hope. And when alone, assure him of the support of your holy people. And when we have the visible sign of people there with us, it helps to really reinforce that I'm not in this alone. 
the sacrament of reconciliation would take place beforehand. So we do, so like when I go to a hospital room, hey, if you can talk, let's do confession, and then we can bring the family in for anointing. Though nowadays, I think we're still at like one visitor in hospital rooms, depending on the hospital. And, but if I'm coming to your home, if I'm going to a nursing home, they kind of fudge some of those rules. So um, if you're going to be anointed, confession is part of that. If you can't go to confession immediately at that time, it's kind of the same rule when we talk about indulgences, 14 days before or 14 days after. Get to confession as soon as you can, um, basically. Good question. Yeah, the, the, the term last rites doesn't exist. Just like the term limbo doesn't exist. It was never taught by the church, but it was popularized in television. Anytime you see a priest, like there, there were times where I would come in clerics into a hospital, Father, I'm not dying. No, 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 no. I'm just coming to anoint you. I'm not ready yet. That's what I'm here for, to help you get ready. But people will freak out sometimes if they haven't seen a priest in a long time. They're like, I come in like carrying a scythe or something and I'm the angel of death. It's like, no, I'm coming to bless you, I promise. But, but again, it's the misconception many times seen um, because of television. Any last questions? Yeah. Yes. So can an individual be anointed if they have not done the first communion? Yes. Um, what makes you a member of the Catholic faith? Baptism. If you've been baptized, you can be anointed. Um, and yeah, we'll leave it there for right now because I don't have enough time to get into the longer definition. But yes, if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water, you have been baptized into the church, you can then be anointed. Let's end with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this night. I thank you for all of the parishioners here at St. Matthew's and Queen of All Saints, and for all of those who you have put into my life to help enrich my own faith. Continue to watch over us. We give you thanks for all of the sacraments that you've given us to nourish us, shower your grace and mercy upon us, and to help us and guide us in our lives. Watch over us these next two weeks as we continue this preparation season of Advent to prepare for the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at Christmas. Help us to see the true reason for the season is the total gift of your Son to us. Through his birth, his passion, his death and resurrection, that when we are called from this life to the next, we may be reunited with you in heaven. We ask all these things in your Son's name as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Get out. <laughs>